Hello and welcome to this review of my Apple Extended Keyboard. It was made in the United States in 1989, but let's be honest, despite the considerable yellowing of the keyboard, it looks like it could be 10 years younger than it really is. I got it for 50 pence off a recycling centre nearby, but despite how I got it from the UK, it has an American layout, not an ISO one. In fact, I'm not sure that this keyboard was made at all with an ISO layout. Apart from that, it has some Apple weirdness. Um, I'll cover that later. Um, and like its successor, the Apple Extended Keyboard 2, of which I also have a video review, check out the link in the video description if you haven't seen that one yet. It uses a proprietary connection and protocol, so I haven't been able to test this in actual real use as a daily driver. I'll be drawing comparisons between this and AEK2 from time to time, but I won't do a detailed one-on-one -on -one comparison in this video. That'll be for another video and another time. When that is released, I'll put a link to that in the video description as well. The reverse of the keyboard shows the model sticker, and that lists model number M0115, made in the US of A. And while we're on the back, I might as well show you this here. This is the uh, connector that Apple used. It's called the Apple Desktop Bus Cable, and it looks like a PS2 superficially, but it's not the same, and it's completely incompatible. The side of the keyboard also shows that the keyboard is curved. So it's a little bit like having feet extended on this keyboard. But speaking of feet, there are none. There are no feet at all on the keyboard. So you have to make do with the keyboard's native curvature, whether you like it or not, which is <laughs> typically an Apple thing to do, really. The layout is identical to that of the AEK2, and all keys are white. There's no gray keys on it. There are two Apple keys to either side of the spacebar. There are 15 F keys, the last three of which share functions with uh, keys that are commonly here. There's three delete keys, this one, this, and this, and I'm still not sure what the difference is between these two deletes. And the numpad is slightly altered. They fitted in an equals key here, and then shifted these three keys one position away from where they normally are. And in addition, there's no secondary legends on any of the keys. Now, the equals key should be very useful for people who use numbers and equals keys a lot, like you would with Excel, for instance. Uh, so I would have liked that a lot because I use Excel a great deal, um, but this is um, not really a mainstream feature. And apparently, if you use a converter to run this keyboard, uh, the equals key doesn't actually register, which is quite a bummer. In any event, it probably would have been a little bit better if they didn't stick the equals key here, but instead here, and then had these three keys in the positions they normally uh, occupy instead of shifting them all away. The keycaps are nice and thick and are made out of PBT, which doesn't yellow with age, which is why the keys are so much whiter than the rest of the case. Uh, good quality there. And the printing is very nice as well. It's dye sublimed ink, another high quality thing. So these are very good keycaps. The spacebar is a little bit different though. That's still made out of ABS, which is why it's yellowed just as much as the case, which in this case is uh, considerable. The switches it uses are Salmon Alps, they're tactile switches, and they're the older version of what later became Black Alps switches, uh, which are very commonly found in the Dell 8101. Uh, Compared to the Black Alps switches in the Dell 8101, it feels a little bit different though. These switches feel a little bit stiffer, but considerably smoother. They're very nice to type on actually, um, and they're not even that fatiguing despite their stiffness. Like most other types of Alps switches, these are far from silent, and despite being non-clicky, they are louder than some clicky switches I know. I'll give you a quick sound demonstration. The sound is quite pleasant, to be honest. It's partly because of how the case of the keyboard impacts the sound that the keystrokes make. Um, they're very pleasant switches overall. Uh, I think anyone with a heavy typing hand should really quite like these. The caps lock has an Alps lock switch, which means that if you press it, it latches on and stays down. And then when you press it again, it is released back up. 
my uh, review of the AEK2 has a detailed explanation of how this switch works. And this one's pretty much identical to that in the AEK2, except this one happens to have a different slider color, but the mechanism is the same. If you want to know how they work in detail, refer to that video. The build construction of the keyboard is excellent. It feels very solid and it's very heavy. The outer case is thick plastic and on the inside it has a thick metal mounting plate. So that's pretty nice. I'll give it a couple of knocks. can definitely take a few knocks. The squeaky noise you hear, by the way, is no squeak in the case because there's absolutely none. That's just uh, rubber slip pads making a bit of a noise. Overall, I'd say this is a great keyboard. It's very sturdy and very pleasant to type on. Some people even prefer this model to its successor, the AEK2, uh, but personally, I like both of them. I think they're both great keyboards. Um, this keyboard does have its cons, however. Uh, the Apple weirdness, and most of all, the connector and protocol, which makes it impossible to use on anything but an old Macintosh. Um, even if you have a cable, which most of them don't because they're detachable and easily get lost, you need a special converter to make it work. Um, but that particular converter is very expensive, usually more expensive than uh, the keyboard itself. If you can run it though, you'll probably have a lot of fun with it. It's a good keyboard for sure. That concludes it for my review, and following is a video of me typing on this keyboard.